Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And today we're going to deal with uh, what I call an embarrassment of riches. We're going to talk to Robert Curson, who has written a book which I think is really three books in one. Uh, the title of the book that they sent me is Pirate Hunters, Subtitle, Treasure, Obsession, and the Search for a Legendary Pirate Ship. And it's published by Random House. Robert, thank you for joining us. Oh, a total pleasure for me. Thank you. Yeah, one one book, as far as I'm concerned, could be called The Story of the Hunters, the story of uh, mostly the, the two fellows who lead the search for this buried uh, pirate ship. And, uh, and, and you tell each of their stories separately. There are two gentlemen involved, a John Chatterton, and a John, how do you say his last name, Matera? Yes, perfect, Matera. Matera. Now, speaking of John Chatterton, uh, he was a loner in, in high school. He went to a, a high school in a neighborhood that I'm familiar with, uh, Garden City, Long Island. And uh, he was kind of at sixes and sevens, you could say, when he got out of school and and enlisted in the military, in the Army, uh, during the Vietnam War and became a medic. And uh, he believed that the world, uh, that the world isn't good when a person, unless a person has a chance to be good. And there's a story that you tell in, in the book, which uh, of, of his experience in, uh, in, in Nam, which is quite amazing. Uh, you write that the, the, a squad leader by the name of John Lecco, a 28-year-old paper hanger from New Jersey, he's wounded and bleeding, laying in the grass to hide himself while the others took cover behind a dirt mound. And someone yelled for medic. And so our friend uh, Chatterton goes because that's what he's supposed to do. Hang in there, he says. He checks Latico, Laco for a severed artery and then looks back over the field to the platoon. We got to get back, he told Laco. We got to go. And here's where it gets interesting. Chatterton was six foot two, but at 165 pounds, he could not hope to carry the heavier man over his shoulders. So instead, he scooped his arms under Laco's from behind and began to drag him into the open field. Shots rang out, mud and grass spit up. Chatterton knew he would die now, but kept dragging, trying to cover 50 yards that stretched over all Vietnam. All the while, he kept waiting to fall, but his legs kept pushing, and even when he could no longer feel his body, he kept pulling and digging until he was back to the platoon and behind the dirt mound. Dehydrated, exhausted, he hardly heard the Cobra attack helicopters as they arrived and unloaded on the enemy. But he felt the men in the platoon rub his shoulder, move dirt from his eyes, and he heard them call him Doc. Where were you when he told you that story? I was in his home uh, in New Jersey when he told me this the story, and I really didn't expect to hear anything like that um, because uh, I had, you know, come to hear stories about diving and shipwrecks. <laughs> yeah, so, that's what it, this book is about, fella. <laughs> that's right, and, but it turns out that this is a central part of what forms John Chatterton's character, and it's his character um, before anything else that's responsible for the historic and great shipwreck diving he's done and discoveries he's made over the course of a singular career. So to understand what he does in the water, one really needs to understand who he is and who he was um, as he became a man. And he's done some other amazing things as well. He, he was working uh, just outside the World Trade Tower when it went down? That's right. He was in charge. Uh, his, his day job, so to speak, was as a, um, an underwater um, diver construction uh, crew 
Team. Yeah, yeah, welding and so forth, that kind right. of Right, and yeah. so he was in charge of a crew that was underwater uh, right there at the World Trade Center uh, when the 9-11 attacks occurred. And indeed, his men were in the water when it happened. And the uh, crew quarters that they were using was completely crushed by falling debris. And in fact, several of New York's top firefighters were killed inside as they were using it as a temporary headquarters. So he had a very close call there, but acted heroically, as did uh, the guys in his crew, with helping people and uh, helping people to safety at that point. But that was nothing unexpected for the guy you just described who had served with such distinction in Vietnam. The only thing left for him was to become a TV star. And he did that <laughs> And as he well. did that as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he became the host of a, a long-running series on the History Channel called Deep Sea Detectives, in which he and his partner... Uh, Richie Kohler um, explored various shipwrecks around the world and tried to answer um, unanswerable questions sometimes about about these great mysteries that lay under the water. It's it's really really amazing. Now his partner in crime, quote unquote, uh, comes from Staten Island, and uh, when he was in high school, he was uh, already uh, running a numbers racket. And uh, he was in, in touch with a, a family which was kind of like an underboss uh, to the mob. So uh, that that's an interesting uh, background. Somewhere in the material that the publisher sent, uh, there's an interesting phrase that uh, Matera has led a kind of Hollywood couldn't make this up life. What kind of life was it besides a high school loan shark? Well, yes, he, he was uh, involved in some uh, money lending when he was a young guy in high school and had a very good aptitude for numbers and business. Uh, he also lived among uh, members of uh, organized crime. They were part of his neighborhood, uh, the fabric of his neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that uh, really struck me about John Matera was even uh, mixed into this crowd and even with a, a kind of colorful um, and rough-and-tumble upbringing, the thing he loved most in life and the thing which would really deliver him later on was his love of history and especially of historic shipwrecks. So even though he was a very, very tough kid and a very tough guy growing up, I mean, among the toughest guys I've ever met in my life, um, even at eight years old, uh, the best bet if you needed to find John Matera was to go look in a local library or even um, a rare book uh, bookstore. Um, the shipwrecks called to this guy at a very young age and he uh, reveled in the opportunity not just to learn about lost shipwrecks, but to answer questions that had never been answered about them, even to identify them. So uh, he was a mostly average student with the exception of history. Yeah, history, and, uh, he was straight A's. Yeah, well he, well, he was straight A's in history, that's right, and ordinary in, in every other subject. Once you get to know him, you know there's nothing ordinary about him at all. He's a, he's a keen intellect, a very, very uh, a brilliant guy. Um, but this love of history was something that would never leave him, and it's really what would come into play many years later when um, it comes time to search for maybe the hardest kind of shipwreck in the world to find. Well, it is the hardest kind to find. And uh, when we come back, uh, we're, we're going to meet another main character. He hasn't been around since the 17th century, so you better stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Pirate Hunters is the book we're talking about today uh, with uh, it, its author, uh, Mr. Robert Curson. And uh, there's been some very nice things said about this book by advanced readers, one of whom is Brad Meltzer a New York Times bestselling author of a book called The Inner Circle. There's nothing in the world like buried treasure, he writes, and people hungry and obsessed enough to risk their lives for it. Pirate Hunters isn't just a good story. It's a true one. Searching for the souls of its explorers, it takes you to the far tip of the plank and plunges you, plunges you deep to the bottom of the ocean. And that's one of the interesting things about the way you've handled this, that you really do conduct the search not just for the treasure, 
but for the the souls, the what what makes the explorers tick? What kind of people are they, and what and what brings them uh, to the to this kind of, of endeavor? But we need to talk about the main character that's not been around since the uh, 17th century, the pirate himself, Mister Joseph Bannister. A guy who was doing okay, but wanted to do better, and thus he he changed. What did he do? Well, Joseph Bannister was uh, the opposite of a pirate, really, in the 1680s. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a noble English gentleman and a very accomplished merchant sea captain. He was entrusted by wealthy ship owners to carry cargoes between London and Port Royal, Jamaica. And in the 1680s, Port Royal, Jamaica, was known as the wickedest city on earth. It was a town full of sin and sinners and especially pirates. But Bannister, for years, discharged his responsibilities beautifully. He uh, carried hides and uh, sugar and indigo dyes and other valuable cargo between London and Port Royal, often risking his life. It's a very dangerous journey back then, a journey that could take between three weeks and even three months to complete. And for years, as I said, he did this um, perfectly. He was headed for a a soft landing in life, uh, an easy retirement. But one day, uh, for reasons nobody understands for sure, in 1684, he stole the ship he was entrusted with, the Golden Fleece, a 100-foot-long beautiful sailing ship, recruited a top-flight pirate crew, and went on the account, as it was said, of pirating back in those days. Now, just just hold, hold on a minute. You said something that's not true. You said that for reasons unknown, he went to the other side. But one of the great parts of the book are the, are, are the theories that uh, you and the uh, two main guys uh, get into trying to figure out why he did this. That's, that's correct. Uh, I, I should say, according to all official records, there's no indication of right. why he right. did this. But when Chatterton and Matera had the chance to go look for Joseph Bannister's long-lost pirate ship, the Golden Fleece. Um, They thought this would be a very easy endeavor. It turned out to be anything but. (laughs) And after these two men had exhausted every possibility and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and months of their time, they realized uh, a fundamental truth. It was really an epiphany for them that if they were ever going to find this shipwreck, which was located in a bay, a beautiful bay on the north coast of the Dominican Republic, they were going to have to stop looking for the shipwreck. And I know that sounds crazy, in order to find a shipwreck, to stop looking for the shipwreck. But what they realized when they saw how impossible this was and how history had been wrong about this ship for so long, Mm -hmm. unless they were going to find Bannister himself, and that meant to get into the mind and especially the heart of Bannister, to figure out why a man headed for such a soft, sure landing would have risked so much by turning pirate back then. Unless they found the man and found his heart, they were never going to find this ship. So they had to research not just pirates and piracy back then, but Bannister the man himself. And it wasn't until they started to do that and get insights into Bannister himself that they made a real breakthrough in this in this search. There, there are many meetings described uh, in your book. Most of them seem to take place at breakfast. Gentlemen, you write, we have direction. Presiding over a strategy breakfast he called at Tony's, where they had quite a few meals, uh, Matera asked his teammates to imagine themselves back in the golden age when the greatest and most daring pirates had made their names. We need to think like them, he said. If we can think like pirates, we can find them. And that's when he started to talk about, of all things, democracy. The pirates had sailed in the 17th century, but they were men ahead of their time, professional lawbreakers who made inviolable laws for themselves. Matera read to the men from pirate constitutions, describing their voting rights and underlined their foundational idea that any man might become rich if he dared, but that no man should ever become king. Was that a surprise to you when you found that in your research? It's a total surprise to me, and it was a total surprise to Chatterton and Matera, who were conducting this search for the Golden Fleece, that uh, this idea, this concept of democracy um, had taken hold and become a part of uh, almost every 
pirate ship 100 years before it ever took hold in America. And they were stunned to find out that um, constitutions were drawn up on pirate ships, that every uh, man voted on everything, where to go, what to steal, who should be captain, who was marooned, if they should kick out the captain. Um, everything was voted on, and that every man's vote counted the same. The lowliest deckhand's vote counted the same as the captain's. In fact, the captain didn't sleep in any better quarters than the lowliest guy, and he didn't get a single um, piece of turtle to eat more than the lowliest guy. Only in battle would the captain's word rise above the others, and that was strictly because it was required you know, for order. Mm-hmm. But uh, this idea that every man could be um, equal to every other man and that it was the, the will of the group, not just of one man, about everything that would happen to them, and they were going to live and die by this, uh, that gave Chatterton and Matera a huge and deep insight, not just into pirates, but into why Joseph Bannister would have risked so much, because you were going to hang for being a pirate back then. Yeah. Well, he would have risked so much um, at such a time. Well, speaking about risk, let's fast forward to the present day. Uh, and and then when our two guys are looking for this for the ship, I mean they they've got to devote not just a lot of time to it, but bucks after bucks after bucks. It's an incredibly expensive deal, and they they have to form partnerships. They can't do it all by themselves. This is an incredible undertaking. It is, and in the world of treasure hunting and shipwreck hunting you better be in it for more than the rewards that the ship itself might provide once you find it, because it is so expensive, as you say, and so time-consuming and so frustrating so often. You have to be really committed to it. But this, uh, the chance to find this pirate ship spoke to Chatterton and Matera in a very singular way. And it was really because, not just because pirates live in the imaginations of so many people for so long, often since early childhood. Sure, sure. but, But because pirate ships are probably the hardest thing a person can find in the world underwater, and it may be the hardest thing to find in the world anywhere. Until Chatterton and Matera went looking for the Golden Fleece, only one Golden Age pirate ship had ever been discovered in history. That was a ship called the Widda, found in 1984 by an explorer named Barry Clifford off the coast of Cape Cod. But Chatterton and Matera set out to find the second one, which would be the Golden Fleece. But even if they found it, the audacity of thinking that they could prove that it was the Golden Fleece, that was almost beyond reason, because even if you happen to stumble across a Golden Age pirate ship, proving it would be near impossible. So these guys really put it on themselves when they set out to do what looked to be impossible. And as you report in your book, it really was extremely, extremely difficult. When we come back, I'd like to focus a little bit on, on, on the kind of treasures that you can get out of a treasure hunt like this that you're not looking for. We'll be back soon. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Pirate hunters, treasure, obsession, and the search for a legendary pirate ship by Robert Curson. That's our book today. And uh, a wonderful uh, senator by the name of uh, John McCain says about the book, Pirate Hunters is a gripping account of two courageous divers' quest to uncover the shipwrecked vessel of Joseph Bannister, one of history's most infamous pirates. Robert Curson will keep you on the edge of your seat in this high-stakes journey around the globe that ultimately teaches these explorers about much more than an old ship. I started the interview by saying this is three books. One part, one book could be about the hunters. A uh, second part would be the hunted ship and the pirate. And the other thing is the, the business of uh, hunting itself. And I'm sorry, uh, we won't have time to touch on, on much on that, on on how complex it is, how expensive, how overwhelmingly demanding it is. You you don't have a family life if you're on one of these hunts, it seems to me, for example. At any rate, you close out the book, I think, kind of focusing on this uh, notion of divergent rewards, 
rewards coming uh, that you don't expect. And uh, I'd, I'd like you to share uh, some of that with us on starting on page 244. Yes, I'll read from page 244. Great. Thank you. Most of the artifacts from the Golden Fleece remain at the lab. The divers have asked officials there to postpone a division until the dispute with Bowdoin is settled. Given the rarity of the find, it's difficult to put a precise monetary value on the booty recovered from the pirate ship. By some estimates, the collection might be worth several million dollars. But even if a single piece from the Golden Fleece never got sold, the men had their prizes. Chatterton had found the rarest and most exciting kind of shipwreck in the world. Matera had pieced together the story of one of the Golden Age's great pirate ships, changing how history understood her adventures and her final days. Best of all, they'd found Joseph Bannister. Each man also got something else from his discovery, something different from shipwrecks and pirates, even if he didn't expect it at the time. For Chatterton, it was the chance to learn from the Dominicans. He had arrived in Samana believing there was just one way to do things, straight ahead and by sheer force of muscle and will. Then he began watching the locals. Many of them were near destitute, but made to do with whatever scraps they could gather. If they didn't have a jack to change a tire, they used rocks and sticks. If they needed to dive deep to catch fish, they built an air supply system from an old paint compressor and a garden hose. To Chatterton, even the poorest among them seemed to have all they wanted, not because they didn't desire much, but because they always found other ways to get what they needed, always found other ways to go. For Matera, the Golden Fleece answered a basic question. Was it ever too late to follow one's heart? Months into his search for the pirate ship, Matera's view on the matter had been dim. He'd spent several years and more than a million dollars to go after a dream, first of treasure, then of pirates, but had yet to find anything important. Worse, it had begun to occur to him, as the failures and stresses piled up, that there might be nothing out there for him to find. That's when he discovered Joseph Bannister, buried in historical records almost no one had touched for centuries. The pirate captain had been in his 30s or 40s when he'd abandoned a respectable career and a future assured in order to do something daring, something that called to him. To Matera, Bannister's calling was democracy, but what mattered most was that Bannister had answered. Things went badly for Bannister at first. Then he began a singular adventure, one of swashbuckling and daring that culminated in doing the near impossible, defeating the Royal Navy in battle. To Matera, the lesson was clear. A person had to go when his heart told him to go, even if he didn't know how the journey would end. Matera was never the same after that. He fought through frustrations and challenges in Samana, spent even more of his money, then found the Golden Fleece. He kept a cannonball from the wreck, a reminder to listen to his heart when next it asked him to go. How are our heroes doing now? They're doing terrific. They continue to look for lost treasure ships and lost um, shipwrecks all over the world. Uh, they're constantly asking questions of history and presuming that history is not necessarily right, even when recorded in fine history books. <laughs> that's what keeps pushing them. Yeah, that's amazing. That That's amazing. And and And... What about their personal situations, their their family situations? Is it better than when they were on the hunt? Yes, I mean they're both they're both in happy relationships, uh, it seems, and uh, they're hungry for more. But as you said, um, this kind of uh, searching is expensive and it's difficult on family lives. So it's important, uh, as I've learned over the years talking to shipwreck explorers, that you find the right mate because this is not for everyone. And it's a difficult thing to say goodbye to your uh, husband or your wife who goes on a, a treasure adventure, um, not knowing when they'll return or how much money might be spent in the process. One of the uh, stranger things about this kind of business, it seems to me, is that uh, your one of your most, if not the most important partner, uh, can be one of your greatest sources of trouble. I'm thinking of Tracy Bowden. Well, Tracy Bowden was, is a legendary treasure hunter, one of the greats of all time, and has accomplished more in his career than almost any other treasure hunter really in history. He's a, a singular and rare individual 
who has instincts about treasure that are honed over decades. Mm -hmm. He's a, a real legend in the business. He, uh, it was his dream to find the Golden Fleece. He knew about it for decades. Um, and he partnered up with Chatterton and Matera. And uh, together, um, the three of them formed a very, very effective team. But there were, as there often are in shipwreck searches and treasure hunts, um, disagreements among partners and uh, different theories about where to go next or what to do next. And uh, those, some of those played out in this adventure. So um, none of this ever seems to go smoothly. And if you read about treasure hunts, even back into the 1600s, um, there are often uh, conflicts between uh, teammates. So it's, once you learn the history of treasure hunting and shipwreck hunting, it's really nothing that surprising. One of the, if you will, minor characters in, in the story that uh, I liked a lot uh, was Tony Tony Bellotti, the, the boy from Staten Island, from his youth? Yeah, John, uh, John Bellotti is his friend. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, they were, they were very, very good friends and uh, grew up together in, on Staten Island and uh, remained very good friends. He was a very interesting uh, gentleman, and, uh, you know, this is part of John Matera's background, uh, getting street smart. Um, there's a, a street smart element to John Matera, which might have landed him on the wrong side of, of goodness in the world, but instead John Matera took a, a swerve in his life. Might, might have landed him? Hey, he was on his way, I think. Yeah, he, he, could, he really could have been on his way, but instead he swerved in a different direction, and a yeah. man became uh, a beat cop. Uh, believe it or not. And because he understood the streets and understood both sides of issues, um, he was able to see things and spot things that many other new cops weren't. And that led into a, a career in security and being a bodyguard. John Matera ultimately became one of the highest paid personal bodyguards in the world, guarding the kind of people who would appear uh, on the cover of Time magazine. So and now, very- And now he's the subject of one of the best books you'll ever read, if you just have the sense to go out and get it. It's called Pirate Hunters, Treasure, Obsession and the Search for a Legendary Pirate Ship. It's by Robert Kirsten. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C-O-C, or send an email to Jim Foster C-O-C at gmail.com.